The Root Takahira Accord was signed in Washington. Its publication was tactfully withheld until after the fleet had visited Amoy. Although the agreement acknowledged the independence and integrity of China and the principle of equal opportunity, it conceded Japan's special interest in Manchuria. The United States Secretary of War, who had promised that the cruise would be a powerful force to open the door onto China, was disappointed to find that it had the opposite result. Never again will they dare laugh at Uncle Sam, Roosevelt pronounced when he welcomed the fleet safely home next spring. German newspapers, however, observed that America's big stick was no more coercive than a palm twig. The cruise brought the Roosevelt presidency to a close. It had been an exercise in real politic that temporarily succeeded in deflecting Japanese expansion from the Philippines. Its purpose was to buy the time necessary to build the big United States Navy, both the President and Mahan believed essential to carry out America's mission in the Pacific. It was not without significance that in the same year Pearl Harbor in the Hawaiian Islands was chosen as the main Pacific base for the American fleet. This was a compromise to meet the need for a mid-ocean port from which battleships could be sent to protect the Philippines and also guard the canal the United States was building in Panama. The lessons of Port Arthur weighed heavily in the Admiral's calculations. They believed warships in Luzon's Subic Bay could easily be ambushed by a Japanese battle fleet. President Roosevelt approved the United States Navy's decision not to station battleships in the Western Pacific because he thought the Great White Fleet's crews had shown that a fleet could be rapidly deployed to Manila in the event of a crisis. But as Britain was being forced by the German challenge to shift her concerns and her warships from the warm China Sea to the cold swells of the English Channel, the Anglo-American naval presence in the Far East was soon to prove too weak to sustain the China policy. Mahan had warned and Roosevelt foreseen that, in the final analysis, only a powerful military presence would keep the open door open. Their successors were to find that when it came to mines and railways, there was no open door at all. When Theodore Roosevelt left office in 1909, his grand design, which had been founded on expectations of continuing Anglo-Saxon global dominance, was threatened by the spectacular rise of Japanese military and industrial power in the face of Britain's declining presence in the Far East. Policing the empire was now taking second place to guarding the British Isles against the dangers posed by the Kaiser's growing high seas fleet across the North Sea. The alliance with Japan conveniently allowed the Royal Navy to reduce the size of the Singapore fleet so as to concentrate its battleships in home waters. This situation continued, despite the unhappiness of the Dominions and of the Malay Federation, which were providing millions to build new dreadnoughts to match Germany's accelerating naval programme. The enforced British retreat from maritime superiority in the Far East and America's lack of an adequate forward naval base in the Philippines were to give the Japanese de facto supremacy in the Western Pacific. Roosevelt's ambitious foreign policy had anticipated the construction of a large fleet to allow the United States a two-ocean capability. But the actual building of the big navy was a task that his successors inherited, and they found Congress reluctant to provide funds for building the battleships that might spark off a second naval arms race in the Pacific. Yet without the strong fleet necessary to project American power across the ocean, successive administrations still persisted with the policy of trying to impose the open-door China doctrine on Japan. The lack of the big stick of military power to back up their diplomatic posturing was to prove a factor that would lead to Pearl Harbor. The United States Navy's hope for a fleet commensurate with its new Pacific commitments was to be rapidly dashed by Roosevelt's successor. As a former governor of the Philippines, President Howard Taft believed himself an expert on Asian affairs. Declaring the American dollar can aid suffering humanity, he decided that business rather than battleships could guarantee the United States' destiny in China. He drafted the virile young giants of American industry, including the mighty House of Morgan, Bethlehem Steel, the Pennsylvania Railroad and Standard Oil, into the China Consortium. Its mission, to shore up the crumbling celestial empire, was directed with evangelical zeal by the State Department professionals of the newly set up Far East Division. They backed the vision of American adventurers like Willard Strait, who in 1906 was appointed Consul General in Mukden,
To him, China was the new West, and his crusade to use United States policy to establish America's economic supremacy on the mainland was part and parcel of what he confessed was the great game of empire. But while the gunboats of the Far East Squadron successfully advanced the business of the Standard Oil Company up the Yangtze River, the ambitious plans of Strait and the Far Eastern Division came crashing down inland. Through the China Consortium, they had tried to neutralise Japanese and Russian influence in Manchuria by bringing their railway lines under international control. Fear of a United States commercial monopoly had brought the scheme to naught. Efforts by American bankers to win a quarter share of the line being built by Britain, France and Germany along the Yangtze was rendered ineffective when the Hukuang loan scheme foundered because of Chinese suspicions and British reluctance to support it. It was Willard Strait, whose dazzling talent was to take him on to become a partner in the Morgan Bank and to found the influential New Republic magazine, who predicted the failure of dollar diplomacy because the American investor is not willing to buy Chinese bonds unless the government will protect him by all diplomatic means. To the dismay of the Taft administration, Wall Street preferred to invest its money in Tokyo, thereby encouraging the Japanese efforts to further their expansion on the mainland. In 1911, when the rotten edifice of the Manchu state was finally shaken down, its death throes had already, ironically, been hastened by another young American visionary, a half-blind, hunchbacked Stanford graduate by the name of Homer Lee, who became the unlikely leader for the rebel army. The Chinese General Gordon, as his admirers called him, was one of the architects of the revolution, but he died a year after American-educated Dr. Sun Yat-sen was declared provisional president in 1911 of a Chinese republic. It now seemed that the American hope of establishing a republican system on the far side of the Pacific was at hand, yet reality soon dashed these hopes. The new republic was little more than an empty title. Sun Yat-sen's regime in Canton faced the colossal task of establishing its authority over a score of feuding provinces and rival warlords, while the Japanese tried to exploit the breakdown of government to control Manchuria. This struggle for power had been predicted by Homer Lear in his book The Valor of Ignorance, which had created a sensation in 1909 by prophesying the decline of Britain's empire and forecasting an apocalyptic war between the United States and Japan for control of the Pacific. His warnings had raised fresh outbursts of yellow peril fear on the West Coast. Lear's strategic evaluation of the Philippines, Japan's dominion of Asia, will be no more than tentative, and her eventual destruction will depend on who holds these islands, was to become the basis for America's Pacific military strategy until the outbreak of World War II. War plan Orange Orange was the code for Japan, Red for Great Britain and Black for Germany, was finalised by the United States Army and Navy planners in 1911. It was based on the assumption that the troops garrisoning the Philippines could hold out against Japanese attack until relieved by the fleet, which would fight its way across the Pacific for a final showdown with the Imperial Navy. Yet from its inception, the plan suffered from a fatal flaw. It would take weeks, possibly months, for the battle fleet to sortie from its west coast bases and perhaps fight its way across the Pacific, by which time the Japanese could be in control of the Philippines. The steady rise of German naval power was another headache for the admirals after the General Board of the United States Navy had failed in 1911 to convince Congress of the need to accelerate battleship construction to complete the 1903 plan for a fleet of 48 by 1920. Such a big navy was considered a luxury that the penny-pinching politicians of both parties rejected. In 1912, they restricted the laying down of new battleships to one annually. That same year put an idealistic Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, in the White House, who called on Germany and Britain to halt the naval arms race that was spiralling toward war. Elevating principle above practicality, the new administration redoubled its efforts to shape the destiny of civil war-torn China with no more than a small fleet of gunboats to back up diplomacy. If we had a fleet of battleships ploughing the Pacific, if we had a foreign policy persistent and constant in its nature and supported by the big stick, complained the United States Minister in Peking to the Secretary of State, the attitude of the nations towards us might be very different. As it is, we are helpless.' 
Less than a year after the mayor of Tokyo's spectacular gift of cherry trees to Washington, D.C., discriminatory anti-Japanese legislation in California precipitated a new crisis. America prepares for war, ran the headlines in Japan, as the United States Army began reinforcing the Philippines. Like the cousin who had been his predecessor as Assistant Secretary of the Navy 15 years earlier, the young Franklin Delano Roosevelt, responding to the urging of the venerable Admiral Mahan, made plans to concentrate the battle fleet in the Pacific. It brought a storm in the cabinet, as Wilson vetoed the sending of warships through the Panama Canal as inflammatory. In an attempt to alleviate national tensions, Wilson pressured the California state legislature to drop its bill barring Japanese from owning land. Yet the antagonisms between Washington and Tokyo still smouldered on into August 1914, when the Pacific crisis was overshadowed by the explosion of war in Europe. The United States remained officially neutral, but the Wilson administration's determination that Germany shall not be allowed to win this war underscored the unofficial alliance of Anglo-American interests. However, the special relationship was to be strained by events in the Pacific, when Japan, with the encouragement of her naval ally, seized the opportunity of a thousand years to take over the Kaiser's China base at Tsingtao and pounce on Germany's imperial possessions in the Marshall and Caroline Islands. The result in a dramatic shift of the balance of power set the Imperial Navy astride America's sea route to the Philippines. The Japanese government was emboldened to issue 21 demands, which defined a greatly expanded sphere of interest to include Shantung, Fukien, South Manchuria and Inner Mongolia, as well as insisting on placing advisers with the Chinese government. The United States led the chorus of protest at this bid by Japan to take advantage of the European war to reverse the open-door policy and turn China's northern provinces into a vassal state. Only after the strongest pressure from her British ally and President Wilson, who had declared that the United States must be the champions of the sovereign rights of China, did Tokyo withdraw the demands. The crisis in the Pacific, along with the spreading U-boat war across the Atlantic, that in 1915 brought the sinking of the Lusitania, finally awoke Congress to the need for American preparedness and the call for building a navy second to none. That year, the Wilson administration authorised the General Board to plan on a 156-ship programme to build for the United States incomparably the greatest navy in the world within five years. This was cut to three years when the bill was passed in August 1916, in the aftermath of the great clash between the British and German fleets at Jutland two months earlier. The German failure to defeat the Royal Navy's surface supremacy led to renewed emphasis on submarine warfare. The Kaiser's equivocal reaction to Wilson's attempt to restrict U-boat attacks brought the likelihood of war with Germany nearer. It was to become a reality in April 1917, after President Wilson's re-election. The lack of a two-ocean naval capability ruled out any confrontation with Japan. Wilson proclaimed the reason for America's crusade as the world must be made safe for democracy and sent a powerful fleet speeding across the Atlantic to join the Royal Navy at Scarpa Flow. An accommodation with Tokyo in these circumstances was a necessity. Hasty diplomatic negotiations conducted in Washington between Secretary of State Robert Lansing and Japan's ambassador Count Ishii resulted in another pious accord. Announced in November 1917, it reaffirmed the open door, but gave American approval to Japan's territorial acquisitions and her special interests in China. This glossing over of the fundamental split between Tokyo and Washington averted a wartime crisis in the Pacific. Japanese insistence on retaining control of the former German areas, the presence of her troops in Siberia, ostensibly to rescue the white Russian army, and the resolve of America's allies to force Carthaginian terms on Germany wrecked President Wilson's hope that the 1919 Versailles Peace Conference could bring universal disarmament under the League of Nations. Months of wrangling would shred Wilson's utopian 14-point plan. One of the most divisive issues was Japan's determined pressing of a claim to Shantung, in addition to the mandate she wanted from the League to control the Caroline, Marshall and Mariana Islands taken from Germany, 
which Britain had already agreed to support in return for the Imperial Navy's assistance in the Mediterranean during the U-Boat War. United States opposition to this was in no way alleviated by Australia's mandate to New Guinea, the Bismarck Archipelago and the Solomons, or the fact that New Zealand would administer the adjacent Gilbert and Ellis group. Threatened with a walkout that would have wrecked the final stages of the conference, Wilson finally conceded the Japanese demand to remain in control of the Shantung Peninsula in return for a pledge that such occupation was to be temporary. He hoped that he had thereby saved the League, which he believed would be able to hold Japan to her withdrawal and curb what he saw as Prussian militarism. It was a disastrous sacrifice. American opinion, Wilson had told the Allied leaders, was determined that China should not be oppressed by Japan. The president sailed home to find that the Republican senators, led by Henry Cabot Lodge, were raising a vociferous campaign against American participation in the League, which the president had unwisely insisted on linking to the peace terms. Felled by a stroke in the middle of a nationwide tour to rally support for the treaty, the ailing president saw the end of his dream of the United States leading the world in collective security. In November 1919, the Senate voted 55 to 39 against ratification of the Versailles Peace Treaty. The Republican landslide in the next year's elections signalled the finish of Wilsonian internationalism. Although President Warren Harding was careful to include a reminder in his inaugural address to forestall the growing clamour for isolationism. With millions of dollars due in war debts, America had become the world's creditor. Harding's determination to see her the most eminent of nations with a navy equal to her aspirations was a reassurance to his supporters in the business community as well as a recognition that the United States was soon to have a fleet supplanting the power of war-exhausted Britain. To the dismay of the big navy lobby, the isolationists and disarmers in Congress were busy cutting the huge funds allocated to the big 1916 naval building programme. The Navy General Board's insistence on two 16 battleship fleets as the minimum needed to protect our interests in both oceans against any possible combination against us had already led the Japanese to reply by laying down the keels of eight super dreadnoughts to match the mighty 16-inch gunned 40,000-ton monsters being built in America. Joined by the alliance with Japan, the British government viewed with rising alarm the prospect of being caught up in a naval arms race in the Pacific. The Royal Navy had emerged triumphant from the long struggle with Germany, and still nominally supreme at sea. But most of the battle fleet was ageing after arduous wartime steaming, and building replacement warships was placing a crippling burden on the economy of a nation financially exhausted by the Great War. We should be up against the greatest resources in the world, Prime Minister Lloyd George cautioned the Committee of Imperial Defence at its crucial 1921 meeting in London. No British statesman, therefore, could commit his country to what might be a disastrous rivalry, except for the most imperative and convincing reasons. Colonial Secretary Winston Churchill took the view that the alliance would have to be sacrificed, because no more fatal policy could be contemplated than that of basing our naval policy on a possible combination with Japan against the United States. The Prime Minister shared the concern voiced by other committee members that such a course would inevitably provoke Japanese hostility. He reminded Churchill tartly of one more fatal policy, whereby Britain would have to rely entirely on the uncertain support of the United States Navy. The Canadian Prime Minister saw the alliance as incompatible with retaining the close relationship with the United States, but even the anti-Japanese Australian and New Zealand governments appreciated that it might prove better to antagonise Japan for an uncertain and informal relationship with America. The British government now faced having to make a painful decision about the course of strategic policy, with the realisation that Washington rather than Whitehall was the ultimate arbiter. Nonetheless, the committee agreed to go ahead with Admiral Sir John Jellicoe's plan for turning Singapore into the great naval bastion for stationing the Royal Navy's third battle fleet, which would stand guard over the sea route from India to Australia and uphold Britain's extensive interests in China. The public outcry in America grew as the battle between the supporters and opponents of the two ocean fleet raged on Capitol Hill. However, it was not Congress, the traditional enemy of the United States Navy, that was to sink the fleet this time. Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes, in the spring of 1921, 
issued an invitation to world naval powers to assemble that fall in Washington to discuss disarmament. He was planning to bargain with the United States Navy's huge but still unbuilt naval might to bring about a masterstroke of international diplomacy that would halt the naval arms race and placate the pacifists in Congress. And his chances of pulling the scheme off were increased dramatically that summer as the result of an exploit by army aviators. At midday on July 21, 1921, eight biplane bombers rumbled at 90 miles an hour over the Virginia Capes. Above them, in a DH-4 fighter trailing a long blue pennant, flew the Assistant Chief of the Army Air Corps, Brigadier General William Mitchell. After months of trying to persuade his superiors and still more reluctant admirals of the potential of air power, Billy Mitchell had been given the chance to demonstrate that the airplane had made the battleship obsolete. As they flew toward the former German dreadnought Oistfriesland, wallowing at anchor in the long Atlantic swells, Mitchell knew he must not fail the test. We had to kill, lay out and bury this great ship. Watching the bombers peel off one by one to make their attack were the top brass of the United States military establishment, foreign military attaches, and the press corps packing the deck rails of the battleship Pennsylvania, a floating grandstand anchored a safe distance from the rust-streaked dreadnought. The tall waterspouts of near misses temporarily hid the Estfriesland. Then great gouts of yellow flame flowered from her superstructure and decks, proving that the hardened steel of Mitchell's specially designed 2,000-pound bombs had penetrated the Krupp armour plate. It took less than half an hour for the hull of the veteran of the 1916 Battle of Jutland to succumb to the air attack and sink stern first. A long, mournful wail of ship's sirens saluted her end as the bombers circled in triumph over the debris. Aboard the Pennsylvania, the Secretary of the Navy and the Admirals gave the appearance of attending a funeral, as if one of their dearest friends was being buried, and they couldn't believe it, as one journalist observed, noting too that it was a general who pronounced the epitaph, A bomb has been fired that will be heard round the world. The release of sensational newsreels showing a handful of seemingly flimsy planes dispatching the great battle wagon turned Billy Mitchell into a hero overnight to the backers of disarmament in Congress, who demanded why they should go on wasting millions building battleships that could be sunk by an aircraft costing only a few thousand dollars. Captain Mahan's doctrine, however, was to prove harder to sink than the Estfriesland. The sceptical gun club admirals still refused to believe that airplanes would seriously threaten fleets manoeuvring at high speed and protected by anti-aircraft guns. Their views were upheld by the September 1921 report of the United States Army-Navy Joint Board, endorsed by the August signature of Chief of Staff General John Black Jack Pershing. The battleship is still the backbone of the fleet and the nation's defences, it concluded, much to the anger of Mitchell's supporters. For four more years, America's flamboyant apostle of air power waged a relentless campaign to change his superior's blinkered attitudes, a crusade he continued even after his celebrated court-martial for insubordination in 1925 and subsequent resignation. But the Japanese military establishment took Mitchell's doctrine of air power more seriously. The Imperial Navy immediately began intensive studies to learn how to apply the lessons their observers had noted during the Estfriesland sinking. America's Secretary of State had been impressed too, but perhaps not quite in the way that Billy Mitchell had intended. Charles Evans Hughes, a former Republican presidential candidate who had been only narrowly defeated by Woodrow Wilson in 1916, was preparing to open a new chapter of diplomatic history that would ensure the United States supremacy in the Pacific. After the great airplane versus battleship controversy that summer, it was clear that Congress would never vote the funds required to complete a navy second to none. We are seeking to establish a Pax Americana maintained not by arms, but by mutual respect and goodwill, Hughes said in July, anticipating that the conference would achieve a far broader purpose than the naval limitation objective which the United States Senate had just approved. On November 12, with the statesmen and admirals of the world's leading powers assembled in the palm-decorated hall of the Daughters of the American Revolution, Hughes played his powerful hand with a spectacular flourish at the opening day's session. Cheers broke from the press gallery at his announcement that competition in naval armaments must stop 
followed by the breathtaking proposal that this should be achieved by the immediate scrapping of over a million tonnes of warships. It was a move that caught the politicians by surprise and left the admirals spluttering. Britain's first sea lord, the dashing war hero Earl Beatty, appeared like a bulldog sleeping on a sunny doorstep who had been probed by the foot of an itinerant soap canvasser. Mr Secretary Hughes sank in 35 minutes more ships than all the admirals of the world have destroyed in a cycle of centuries, was how Colonel Reppington, the veteran reporter of the Times of London, described the impact of that momentous opening day. But by volunteering that America should set the example to other nations in the wholesale scrapping of her mighty fleet, Hughes had ensured the support of the British. Prime Minister Lloyd George had taken pains to reassure worried members of the House of Commons that the Royal Navy was not about to give up its century of maritime supremacy or its guardianship of the Empire's trade routes. The delegation led by former Prime Minister Arthur Balfour had been sent to Washington to maintain our close friendship and cooperation with Japan in order to sustain the open door and preclude any competition in naval armaments between the Pacific powers. The survival of Britain's alliance with Japan was, however, secondary to Lloyd George's relief at being offered the chance to avoid a ruinous arms race by America's grand gesture of disarmament. Hughes had also cleverly constructed his plan to leave the Royal Navy with a face-saving superiority of 22 capital ships to the United States Navy's proposed 18, although these would be more modern battleships. Already in the throes of an economic crisis and in debt to the United States Treasury for multi-million dollar war loans, the British government overruled the objections of its admirals to indicate willingness to go along with the American plan and also use its influence to persuade the Japanese ally to accept it. The Tokyo delegation fiercely opposed the attempt being made to cut back its battle fleet to 10, which would leave Japan permanently at a 60% inferiority to the navies of the Anglo-Saxon powers because Hughes had called for a 10-year naval holiday in capital ship construction. For a month, the Japanese held out against the limitation plan, unaware that behind the scenes the United States Army's most skilled codebreakers were at work in a secret black chamber located in New York, busily monitoring the confidential cable exchanges with Tokyo. This gave Secretary Hughes the immense advantage of being able to stay ahead of the negotiations, because he knew that the Japanese government had already decided to accept his limits if their delegates could not get an improvement on the 355 ratio demanded by the United States and Britain. Fittingly, it was left to Britain's last Victorian Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour, to engineer the terms to which the Japanese finally agreed. Limitation was made conditional upon British and American assurances that the status quo would be maintained in the Far East by their promises not to build major bases in Hong Kong, Guam or Manila. In return, Japan undertook not to station military planes or warships in the mandated islands under her control. Hawaii and Singapore were specifically exempted from this supplementary treaty, which was accepted by Tokyo, after Japan had been conceded the right to finish construction of one more battleship, the Mutsu, for which Venn had allegedly been collected by Japanese schoolchildren. The acceptance by France and Italy of a capital ship ratio half that of Japan's made it inevitable that the British government would accede to the Washington Naval Treaty, despite the disquiet of the admirals. By doing so, the British signalled another major retreat from imperial power, even as it became clear that continuing the Anglo-Japanese naval alliance was incompatible with Hughes's scheme of imposing a moral Pax Americana in the Pacific. As Lloyd George had foreseen, Britain was to be left tenuously dependent on the special relationship and the United States Navy for protecting her interests in the Far East. This became plain when the Committee of Imperial Defence warned that in the event of another European conflict tying down the home and Mediterranean fleets, the Royal Navy would have no warships to spare from which a third fleet could be formed. Hence, there would be no fleet to send to Singapore to defend the approaches to Australia, the vital rubber and tin supplied by Malaya, or the immense capital Britain had invested in China. There was no choice but to assume that the United States could be relied on for support. Confident that the Naval Limitation and Non-Fortification Treaty had established parity in the Pacific, Secretary Hughes made it the foundation on which he began the next round of negotiations to achieve his principal diplomatic goal, 
to secure the open door policy and preserve China's integrity by restraining Japanese expansion on the mainland. He knew that a weak Britain was ready to cut her ties with the Imperial Navy in return for assurances that Anglo-American economic supremacy would remain dominant. But as the Australian Prime Minister William Hughes had already warned the Imperial Conference meeting that year in London, this economic rivalry underlay the differences with Japan. What he termed the modern riddle of the Sphinx had to be resolved. There were no easy solutions because, as he pointed out, Japan feels her geographical circumstances give her a special right to the China markets, but other countries want the market too, and so comes the demand for the open door. An additional complication was the racial slur felt by the Japanese as a result of his government's white Australia policy against Oriental immigration. Conflicting demands were building up that made a clash in the Western Pacific inevitable. William Hughes warned, Talk about disarmament is useless unless the cause of naval armament is removed. This was the very trap that Secretary Hughes was setting up for himself and his successors. The Washington Conference was not concerned with attempting to reconcile the forces behind Japan's expansionism, only with containing them. The limitation treaty on which future American policy in the Far East would be based could only be effective if the United States maintained its fleet to the treaty limits necessary to maintain its 5-3 to three superiority in the Western Pacific. Economic pressures would soon force the United States Navy to fall behind, and the status quo shifted against America as the Japanese carefully maintained their fleet strength. After a decade of relative stability, that advantage was to be exploited. Japan's renewed aggressive thrust into China left the Western powers without the military strength or unity to enforce the open door. Hughes's first step was to sever the ties between London and Tokyo, offering Japan in exchange a four-power treaty with Britain, France and the United States, in which each guaranteed to respect the other's territories and interests. A key part of that diplomatic package required the Japanese to give up their concession to the Shantung Peninsula in a quid pro quo with the British to abandon their base at Wei Hai Wei, both of which the Chinese government vociferously maintained since the Versailles Conference had been conceded under pressure. The worn rhetoric promising to respect the sovereignty, the independence and the territorial and administrative integrity of China was solemnly reiterated again and agreed to by the nations taking part. After 20 years, the Nine Power Treaty finally established Hay's Open Door Doctrine as a binding commitment on the whole international community. But it was only made acceptable to Tokyo by the inclusion of a proviso that the signatories would ban action inimical to the security of national interests in China. Japan was also given confidential assurance by former Secretary of State Elihu Root, the eminence grease behind the drafting of the treaty, that this was intended to be recognition of their extensive railway and industrial interests in Manchuria. When the Nine Power Treaty was paraded for signature on February 12, 1922, Secretary Hughes delivered a valedictory that summed up the five months of haggling, compromise and backstairs dealing as the greatest step in history to secure the reign of peace. Time would prove that the Washington Treaty System, signed without a word about how it was going to be enforced, was in fact worthless. An international kiss was how one sceptical United States senator unkindly but accurately dismissed Secretary of State Frank Kellogg's later attempt to shore up the paper edifice in 1928 with a treaty outlawing aggression and war. The outcome of the Washington International Conferences did not please the United States Navy. The limitation treaty negotiated by Secretary Hughes would have made Mahan turn in his grave. The fleet that was second to none had been scrapped, and three decades of naval experience ignored. Roosevelt's warning that the Philippines would become America's Achilles heel now appeared only too true. Without sufficient warships, the Orange War plan was to remain no more than a comforting fiction. The sole consolation for the admirals was that the hulls of two partly completed battlecruisers had been salvaged from the wholesale scrapping on the slipways, these were scheduled for completion as the big carriers Lexington and Saratoga, and their speed at long range would later provide practical demonstrations under the command of successive far-sighted officers to develop the tactics of independently operated fast carrier strike forces 
that would ultimately save the United States Navy in the Pacific. Secretary Hughes promised that the Washington Treaties of 1921 would usher in an era of good feeling in the Far East. The era proved to be less than a decade, during which the United States Navy again declined and the economy boomed, as industry turned to producing consumer goods instead of armaments. The Washington Treaty System succeeded in ensuring that the door stayed open, if not wide open, to trade and investment in China during the booming 20s, as Japan carried out her promise to withdraw from Shantung, and Britain made a stage-by-stage -stage surrender of her extraterritorial concessions in Kwantung, Hankou and Amoy, in addition to surrendering supervisory control of Chinese trade and customs collections. This was part of continuing Anglo-American efforts to strengthen the authority of the strife-torn Republican government, which continued its struggle to reimpose strong central control over an unruly China, torn by communist factions and semi-independent provincial warlords and governors. The frequent internal upheavals and rebellions gave the Japanese the excuse to retain their Kwantung Army's garrison along the Manchurian Railway and their extensive mining operations. Britain also used it as the justification for continuing the Royal Navy's gunboats on the Yangtze and the policing of the international port of Shanghai. The endemic instability of the Chinese Republic continued to be a disincentive to American investors and bankers, who put their money into the flourishing industries of Japan, while the Japanese increased their investment in mineral-rich Manchuria. By the end of the 20s, Tokyo and London shared equal control of 70% of all the foreign investment in China, compared to the United States' 6% stake. After all the trumpeting about the promise of the legendary China market, by 1930, American exports to Japan were running at twice the rate, and this had doubled by mid-decade to make the Japanese their third largest overseas customer. The United States had by now replaced Britain as the principal market for silk export, as Japan became increasingly dependent on American oil and strategic raw material imports. Buoyed by the rising expectations, an increasingly urbanised population became devotees of the Western lifestyle, jazz and Hollywood films. Massive dollar loans helped finance the rebuilding of Tokyo after the devastating 1923 earthquake, although the Japanese accusation that the interest rates were usurious would cause friction. Everywhere I go, I hear the opinion expressed that our countries have at last understood one another, United States Ambassador Woods reported that year, that we are united in ties of friendship more strongly than any paper treaty could establish. The ties were to be strained once again the following year when Congress passed the Natural Origins Act to end mass immigration. Its total ban on immigration by Orientals while allowing a quota of Europeans was another reminder, like the White Australia Act, of the Anglo-Saxon nation's racialism. Japan protested about that racial insult, and her extreme nationalist patriotic societies, already fearing the erosion of traditional values, called for a boycott on American goods, films and music. However, they had little impact on a public seemingly enchanted with modelling itself on the celluloid image of a United States that visiting students and Imperial Navy midshipmen found from personal visits was truly a promised land of unbounded plenty and industrial might. Until the end of the twenties boom, Japan's imperialists were held in check by a succession of moderate governments elected from the majority party in the Diet, and by the country's growing dependence on the United States economy. When Wall Street sneezes, Tokyo catches flu, was the joke often repeated by Japanese businessmen, until they were hit by the financial cataclysm that struck their economy after the American stock market crash in 1929. The value of the yen plummeted, driving Japan off the gold standard. The market for silk, the country's main export, vanished, ruining millions of small farmers who depended on the silkworms for their livelihood. The world slump deepened, while the high-tariff barriers erected by the Western nations sheltered their own shrinking industries, but dried up the market for Japan's manufactured goods. National discontent grew. The Zaibatsu, the conglomerate family banking and industrial empires like Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumimoto and Yashuda, which ruled the heights of the Japanese economy, were protested by left-wing groups pressing for agrarian reform and by the growing lines of unemployed, 
The nationalists in the armed services, chafing under the restrictions of the Naval Limitation Treaty, blamed the Japanese government for conceding too much and becoming too dependent on the United States by failing to exploit the opportunities on the Chinese mainland. The impact of the depression was to turn Japan again toward an aggressive expansion of her interests on the Asian mainland, where the Imperial Kwantung Army, guarding the Japanese railways and coal mines in Manchuria, now faced a growing threat posed by Chinese nationalism. Following the death of Sun Yat-sen in 1925, the presidency of the strife-torn republic had passed to an ambitious young general, Chiang Kai-shek. He proved both a ruthless and an effective leader, undertaking a military campaign to crush the communist faction with which the government had been in uneasy alliance. Determining to bring the provincial warlords under his nationalist control, Chiang moved the seat of the Kuomintang government from Canton to Nanking on the Lower Yangtze in 1927. He then set out with his Kuomintang army on a northern expedition, reaching Peking the following year. This brought United States recognition of the extension of the Republic's authority, as well as increasing support from the Soviet Union. Washington's open encouragement of Chiang Kai-shek's anti-imperialist crusade sent tempers flaring in Tokyo. The United States was charged with breaching the Four Power Treaty because the Kuomintang Army's march northward was seen as a menace to Japan's extensive economic and industrial interests in Manchuria. This roused the concern of the military bureaucracy, which the Meiji Constitution had invested with inviolable and supreme control over the navy, army and national security. The growing division between the moderate civilians in the government and the military leadership was exacerbated during the course of the 1930 London Naval Conference. The ten-year naval holiday on capital ship construction was ending, and the Imperial Navy wanted to raise its battleship strength by 10%. The United States, whose own fleet had been falling behind even the 553 ratio, was not about to allow the Japanese to gain superiority in the Pacific, and not only resisted, but sought to get the capital ship limit extended to cover cruiser construction. The British, who regarded cruisers as the essential warships of imperial defence, had been instrumental in excluding them at Washington, and after ten years were no more enthusiastic to concede. But with the Royal Navy under the cost-cutting acts of a Labour government battling to survive the worsening depression, the British once again sided with the Americans. Although the delegation led by Admiral Kichisaburo Nomura left London with what amounted to a de facto agreement to a 70% cruiser ratio, the civilian-dominated cabinet in Tokyo lost face with the armed services by capitulating over their battleship plans. Reaction to what Winston Churchill perceived as yet another example of the spurning of an Asiatic power by the Western world was swift. A wave of indignant protest swept through the young officer cadres of the Imperial Navy, who charged the politicians with betraying the nation. On November 14, Prime Minister Yuko Hamaguchi was shot at Tokyo Station. Drastic surgery saved his life, but the assassination attempt was followed by a succession of plots hatched by the army and patriotic societies against the Diet. Democracy in Japan was now facing a severe test. The cabinet of the ailing Hamaguchi was forced out of office in April, but the new Prime Minister, Reijiro Wakatsuki, who had been chief delegate at the recent London conference, was given a rough passage. It was soon evident that Tokyo had lost control of the headstrong generals of the Kwantung Army, as incidents escalated that summer along the Manchurian railway line their troops were guarding. Three years earlier, in pursuit of their goal of turning Manchuria into a satellite state of Japan's, they had dynamited the train of the venerable Marshal Chang Tso Lin, disposing of the Chinese warlord who appeared to be transferring his allegiance to the nationalist cause. The final stage of their takeover plan went into operation on September 18, 1931, when another explosion on the tracks outside Mukden provided the excuse the Kwantung army needed to send its troops marching out across Manchuria in pursuit of Chinese bandits. As the conquest of Manchuria got underway, it was applauded by the rightists, the Strike North faction of the army, and influential patriotic groups led by the Cherry Blossom Society. The Wakatsuki cabinet was reduced to cabling the Kwantung generals to guard against impetuous acts and fielding the loud chorus of international protest.
Recognising that unless Japan honoured her obligations under the Nine Power Pact, the whole Washington Treaty System would collapse, Secretary of State Henry Stimson urged that America should take the lead in threatening sanctions. If we lie down and let them treat them the treaty system like scraps of paper, nothing will happen, and the future of the peace movement will receive a blow that it will not recover from for a very long time. President Herbert Hoover, although an old China hand himself, and equally determined to uphold the moral foundations of international life, feared that sanctions would lead to war. Stimson's proposed oil and trade embargo resembled sticking pins in tigers to the president, who was concerned that his Secretary of State was proving more of a warrior than a diplomat. Nonetheless, Secretary of War Patrick J. Hurley argued that Japan would only respond to force, although Hoover eschewed such action because the United States had never set out to preserve peace among nations by force and would give no backing to Britain and France in bringing pressure to bear on the aggressor through the League of Nations. The Manchuria crisis had to be settled through the Nine Power Treaty and the Kellogg Pact, which were solely moral instruments. Still, the President recognised that America must find a way of discharging her treaty obligations through appropriate moral reprobation to turn on Japan. By December, Hoover and Stimson concluded that the way out of the dilemma was through the concoction of a declaration inviting the League to join the United States in refusing to recognise the fruits of aggression. The weakness of this position was self-evident, but Hoover told his cabinet, non-recognition might not prevent aggression, but recognition would give it outright approval. On January 7, 1932, the United States took the lead with the publication of Stimson's non-recognition note, announcing that no settlement in Manchuria would be recognised that did not conform strictly to terms set out for the Republic of China's territorial integrity that bound the signatories of the Nine Power Treaty. The note, which Hoover believed would be one of the most significant diplomatic papers of the century, was delivered to China and Japan, to be followed by a similar declaration from Britain. The last, much to the State Department's annoyance, left out reference to territorial integrity and was seen in Tokyo as a tacit recognition by London of special Japanese interests in Manchuria. America's moral stance and diplomatic bluff was effectively called on January 28, when the Imperial Navy sent a fleet to Shanghai. Stimson wanted to send in the Asiatic fleet to put the situation morally in its place, but such a show of force would have been impossible without the Royal Navy's support, and the British government made it clear that it was not prepared to get embroiled, while the fleet base at Singapore was incomplete. In any case, the President refused even to keep the Pacific fleet at Hawaii after its mid-February manoeuvres as a big stick threat to Japan. On February 23, five days after the League had formally given its support to the non-recognition doctrine only to be greeted with renewed Japanese aggression, Stimson responded by publishing an open letter to Senator William E. Borah. This merely reiterated the United States' position and hinted at a renewal of the naval race in the Pacific in an effort, as the Secretary of State put it, to encourage China, enlighten the American public, exhort the League, stir up the British and warn Japan. If it achieved any of these objectives, it failed miserably to deter the Japanese. Moral reprobation, while it satisfied the high-mindedness of Americans like Hoover, who wished to condemn aggression but take no risk to halt it, predictably had little effect in Tokyo. The new cabinet under Tsuyoshi Inukai that had followed the December ouster of Wakatsuki by army pressure was walking a precarious tightrope. The 75-year-old premier, with the emperor's encouragement, hoped to appease the military by encouraging a de facto mainland state which, through diplomatic bargaining with the Chinese nationalists, could be brought into being without an outright rupture of the Nine Power Treaty. But without waiting on Tokyo, the Kwantung army proclaimed the puppet regime of Manchukuo independent in March 1932, and although the Japanese finally withdrew from Shanghai in May, Chiang Kai-shek, with American encouragement, broke off negotiations. The collapse of Inukai's diplomacy precipitated his assassination that same month in an attempted coup led by fanatical army officers of the Cherry Blossom Society, who slew one of the leading Zaibatsu, Baron Takuma Dan, head of the Mitsui Combine. 
The sensational trial, in which the insurrectionists appealed to the emperor to intervene to restore the traditional national harmony of Shoa, by ousting Western-style politicians and industrialists, attracted enormous public support and resulted in only light sentences. In response to the new national mood, Prince Sionji, the last genro, advised the emperor to appoint a whole nation cabinet under Admiral Makoto Saito. Its subsequent moves to recognize Manchukuo reflected the continued demise of moderate politicians and the ascendancy of the militarists under the threat of government by assassination. During the summer of 1932, while Japan moved to consolidate her control over Manchuria, Stimson repeated his call for the will of the people of the world to rally to the cause of the Kellogg Pact. The League responded by sending a commission of inquiry led by Lord Lytton to investigate the situation in Manchuria. The Japanese made little attempt to hide the consolidation of their control of what was now a mainland satellite state, even while the League Commission under Lord Lytton was in Manchuria on its fact-finding investigation. Stimson again repeated the US, call for the will of the people of the world to rally behind the Kellogg Pact and condemn aggression. But the formal Japanese recognition of the Manchukuo regime in September exposed the international kiss for what it was, an inspiration to Mussolini and Hitler when they too set Italy and Germany on a course of militaristic aggression. Fascist powers might turn outward on a course of expansive conquest, but the democracies turned inward in response to the impact of the Depression. In Britain and the United States the dole lines lengthened, and the budgets of the armed forces were slashed in an effort to alleviate the deepening economic misery. As American public opinion took refuge in the creed of isolationism, British chiefs of staff became increasingly worried about the weakening Anglo-American presence in the Far East, and began urging the government to accommodate rather than confront Japan in China. The alternative was to step up an impossibly expensive programme to build British military power, based on Singapore, Yet as the 1932 meeting of the Committee of Imperial Defence warned, it would be the height of folly to perpetuate Britain's defenceless state there. Then the war plan was little more than a draft improvisation calling for the withdrawal of British troops from Shanghai and Tientsin to garrison Hong Kong before a Japanese advance. It was hoped that the Crown Colony that was the centre of Britain's commercial power could be defended by submarines, until a battle fleet could steam out all the way from home waters to Singapore. But even the most optimistic estimates suggested that this would take at least 42 days, and in common with the United States Orange War Plan for sending the fleet to Manila, it took little account of the attrition that such an ocean march of battleships would suffer, or how speedily Japan might be able to mount her own offensive. Defied by the Japanese in Manchuria and defeated by the American electorate in his bid for a second term, President Hoover hoped to leave office with the League of Nations solidly backing the United States position over China. The Lytton Commission's report in January 1933 was far from the total condemnation that Washington expected. However, the League's refusal to recognise Manchukuo was enough to precipitate Japan's withdrawal as her Kwantung army marched southwest toward Peking into Jehol province, and the militarists in Tokyo believed they had now shed themselves of all restraint. America's consistent refusal to invoke nothing more than words in support of the League and the treaty system her own diplomats had engineered had shown just how toothless and helpless the international community was when it came to upholding and enforcing the fragile framework on which peace rested. A dangerous precedent had been set. The military themselves and the public through military propaganda are prepared to fight rather than surrender to moral or other pressures from the West, Ambassador Joseph Grew warned from Tokyo. He predicted that a continued pursuit of the non-recognition doctrine without adequate means or will to enforce it on Japan would mean that one side or the other would eventually have to eat crow. It was a percipient and timely warning. But the incoming Democratic administration failed to heed this call for a realistic approach to Far Eastern policy. President-elect Franklin D. Roosevelt had announced in January 1933 that he would continue Hoover's China policy to uphold the sanctity of international treaties. Faced with the urgent need to implement his promised New Deal so as to stave off the collapse of the American economy, 
Roosevelt knew he had no choice but to continue putting principle before expediency when it came to dealing with Japan's aggression. There could be no accommodation because of the deepest sympathy he felt for China through his Delano ancestors. Yet he was no more prepared than Hoover had been to countenance sanctions or a display of military force in the Pacific. On March 7, he warned the cabinet members at its second meeting to avoid war with Japan. Morality rather than reality continued to dominate and add to the dangerous contradiction inherent in America's stand in the Far East. While the British began to shift toward a policy of appeasement to accommodate Japanese expansion in the absence of any positive American move to curb it, the State Department's old China hands, led by Stanley K. Hornbeck, were equally determined that the open door was not going to be shut by Japan's imperialist drive. They were to find that it would take more than moral pronouncements to keep it open. The hardliners, against any change in the status quo, found a willing supporter in the Secretary of State. Cordell Hull was a veteran Tennessee lawyer who owed his appointment to his standing among the Southern Democrats rather than to the President's belief that a wiser and more experienced intellect was needed to unravel the tightening knots in American Far Eastern policy. To Hull's untutored and blinkered perception of international affairs, all problems ultimately devolved into a simplistic issue of trade barriers. This view worked against any attempt by State Department minds less rigidly locked on China than Hornbeck's to deal with the narrow range of choices facing the United States as the Far East crisis worsened in succeeding years. America could make the firm stand against Japan that Hoover had been unwilling to risk, or, as Grew suggested in his letter to the new president, she would withdraw gracefully and gradually, perhaps, but not the less effectively in the long run, permitting our treaty rights to be nullified, the open door to be closed, our vested economic interests to be dissolved. Since by 1930 these investments in China totaled less than $200 million, while annual exports to Japan were approaching that same figure, there was sound economic justification for following this course. A century of commitment to the Chinese market made it emotionally and politically unthinkable for Roosevelt to pull out of China. Instead, Gru's alternative, which was to insist and continue to insist, not aggressively yet nonetheless firmly, on the maintenance of our legitimate rights and interests in this part of the world, was adopted as the guiding principle of the new administration's Far Eastern policy. This involved encouraging Chinese resistance as the counterforce to Japan's aggression. The course necessitated Hull's early rejection of Chiang Kai-shek's suggestion that the United States act in the role of mediator. Nor was the Secretary of State prepared to act out the role of mentor to the League when it was suggested that America take the lead in proposing an arms embargo. Sanctions, Roosevelt believed, would lead to war, and he was no keener to embark on this risk-strewn course than his predecessor. The President made clear to Ambassador William C. Bullitt the following year that force was not an option when he proposed following Theodore Roosevelt's big navy policy with the advice, we should speak softly and build three ships to her one. Japan's withdrawal from the League and the rapid increase of the Imperial Navy's shipbuilding budget heralded the end of naval limitations, and with it the collapse of the Washington Treaty System for maintaining the status quo in the Pacific. Ambassador Gru had reported that the Japanese military now looked on America as their principal enemy because the United States is standing in the way of their nation's expansion. This was a clear warning that Washington's policy of encouraging China's intransigence in refusing to recognize Manchukuo would eventually reach the point where Japan would either have to climb down or escalate an all-out war on the mainland to reach a final resolution of the dispute. The warning brought an intensive study in Washington of the Orange War Plan. It had been revised many times to take account of the cuts in naval appropriations, and by now the time that would be taken for the Pacific Fleet to make its forced march across the ocean made its implementation all but impossible. The army was way below strength, at less than 100,000, without modern aircraft and tanks. The navy had fallen short of its treaty strength, and was in need of 30,000 men. Because of economies on maintenance, the fleet could only steam at full speed for four hours. To start construction of 26 new warships, Roosevelt resorted to earmarking $250,000 from the National Recovery Programme, 
ostensibly to provide work in the shipyards. Such expenditure would not enable the United States to match the 150 new warships built by Japan in the decade. But the collapse of the 1934 Disarmament Conference, dismissed by Winston Churchill as a solemn and underscore protracted farce, alarmed enough congressmen to ensure passage of a bill that would lay down the hundred warships and thousand aircraft needed to bring the United States Navy up to full treaty limits. The president faced a public storm stirred up by the professional pacifists, who accused him of launching a fresh naval arms race. Yet he feared that even with the proposed increase in strength, the United States Navy would have to abandon the Philippines. An ominous move was made in April 1934 by the Tokyo Foreign Ministry, which issued a stiff protest against technical and financial assistance to China. It was followed by a secret and confidential report from the commander of the Asiatic Fleet and general commanding the Philippines, who warned that the spectacular rise of Japan's sea and air power had combined to make the defence of Manila Bay and Corregidor futile with the forces available. This shattering admission that America's Pacific defence plan was a sham came only a month before Congress passed the Tidings-McDuffie Act to make the Philippines independent by 1946. The isolationist-inspired bid to ditch the United States' main base in the Far East undermined the State Department's China policy and destroyed any credibility in the Orange War plan. Notwithstanding, Orange remained the cornerstone of the United States' military strategy because, although the Navy planners were strongly advising withdrawal to Hawaii to defend the Eastern Pacific, there was no acceptable alternative. The fallacies inherent in this brand of Potomac strategy were to dominate the thinking of admirals and generals in Washington until they were uprooted by the bombs falling on Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. Yet the dangers were more than evident by the autumn of 1935. Delegates of the naval powers were due to meet in Britain to discuss what was to be done when the Washington and London Limitation Treaties expired the following year. Facing a de facto Pax Japonica in the Far East, unless the Imperial Navy could be held to the old restrictions, the Anglo-American delegations refused to countenance Japan's demand for parity. Since Hitler's Germany had already inveigled British support for a battleship and submarine programme, the new Japanese cabinet of Admiral Keisuke Okada, under pressure from the Navy, appreciated only too well that its political survival depended on Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto returning from London with an agreement to build a fleet equal in strength to Britain and America. This intransigent position brought about the breakdown of the conference after months of futile discussion. Japan's subsequent abrogation of the Washington Naval Treaty and rapid laying down of new battleships upset the military balance of the entire system of pacts on which the stability of the Pacific region was founded. A large fleet now became essential if Tokyo was to succeed in enforcing its own Monroe Doctrine in the Far East, an idea that was formally couched in a proposal sent to Washington for the joint partition of the Pacific, so that each nation could define a reign of law and order in the regions geographically adjacent to their respective countries. Cordell Hull quickly and publicly denounced the plan because it would give Japan what he termed carte blanche to deal as she pleased with China. The United States would not go back on our treaties. But in refusing to abandon the open-door policy and without the determination to use force to defend it, by 1935 even the State Department hardliners saw that this would lead Japan into a continuing encroachment in China. By limiting their policy to righteous protests, Americans were simply passing the burden of sustaining their position onto the long-suffering Chinese. The President's State of the Union message in January 1936 was full of gloom. Japan had walked out of the naval limitation talks, Italian troops were marching through Ethiopia, and the Nazis had assassinated the Austrian Chancellor, prompting Roosevelt's warning that many of the old jealousies are being resurrected old passions aroused, new stirrings for armaments and power in more than one land rear their ugly heads. A month later, he was asking Congress for the biggest naval appropriations in history for prudent self-defence. A storm of opposition was organised by the isolationists and pacifists. A million signatures were collected by the People's Mandate to End War. 50,000 veterans staged a march for peace in front of the White House, and children organised a classroom strike to demand schools, not battleships, 
To hell with Europe and the rest of the nations, roared one senator, summing up the tidal wave of isolationist sentiment that swept across America, even as Mussolini was staging his victory parades in Rome. Hitler calling another half million Germans to arms, Japan sending reinforcements to the Kwantung army garrison in Peking, and a ferocious civil war erupting in Spain. But isolationism dominated Capitol Hill. Senator Gerald Nye's neutrality bill passed in August 1936, its purpose to keep the United States in strict international purdah. While American pacifists and isolationists were combining to prevent the president from intervening in the growing turmoil that swept around the world, extremists of quite the opposite temper had struck in Japan. On February 26, 1936, a fanatical band of imperial army officers seized the war ministry. The 73-year-old Prime Minister Okada narrowly escaped assassination by hiding in a laundry closet when the rebels burst into his residence, putting two aides to the sword as part of their plot to dispose of the evil men around the throne. It was three days before the mutiny was put down, during which their calls on the emperor to declare the Showa restoration attracted a great deal of public sympathy from the fervour whipped up by Shinto-inspired patriotic societies and rightist groups demanding a renewal of national unity. Hirohito's general, Prince Sionji, was instrumental in meeting the crisis by installing Foreign Minister Hirota Koki as Premier. Increasingly hostage to the military faction, the new cabinet resorted to red ink bonds to finance an expanded armament programme that was soon swallowing up nearly half Japan's annual budget. Deficit financing drained more funds from the small businessmen and farmers, increasing civil discontent as the Zaibatsu barons whose combines were turning out the new warships, guns and aircraft became richer and still more unpopular with the left. The right-wing groups continued to promote the expansionist cause and the military faction to such a degree that the threat of government by assassination stifled moderate politicians in the Diet. With cabinets increasingly dependent for their survival on the military bureaucracy and moving to the dictates of army policy, Japan was progressing toward a totalitarian fascist state. The Kwantung army had now become the instrument for achieving the goal of national expansion in China as it tightened its grip on Jehol province. Yet rather than force an immediate showdown with the nationalist Chinese forces occupying Peking, Tokyo's military leaders, with one eye on the need to increase their preparedness to meet a Russian threat from Siberia, ordered the troops to be ready for operations in the north and to mount a campaign of economic subversion against Chiang Kai-shek's regime. The German-equipped Kuomintang army was rife with disputes and rebellions that mirrored the problems of the Nanking government as it continued the struggle to bring China's warring provinces and factions under central control. Pursuing his long vendetta against the communists appeared to be Chiang Kai-shek's overriding objective in 1935, as Mao Zedong led the 8,000 survivors of his long march north from Kiangxi to their refuge in the hills of Shenxi province. However, in the closing days of 1936, Chiang's refusal to concentrate his forces against the Japanese brought him into conflict with his own generals, who kidnapped him until he agreed to accept an uneasy alliance with Mao Zedong. With Russian backing and arms, the Kuomintang and communist forces now began an all-out campaign of resistance to the Japanese that Stalin rewarded in August 1937 with a non-aggression pact. Tokyo responded by joining Hitler's anti-Comintern pact and redoubling the effort to bring about a final resolution of the China incident. The conflict between Japan and China was already smouldering during the summer of 1937 when the effete Prince Fumimaro Konoye was called on by the Emperor for the second time to form an administration after the collapse in June of the previous cabinet. This time the popular leader of Japan's rightists accepted. He was an astute political intriguer who had championed the cause of the army's Imperial Way faction because he shared the belief that it was Japan's destiny to rule the Asian mainland. Three years earlier, during a tour of the United States, he had seen how Americans were blinded by faith in the matchless superiority of their own brand of democracy, which contributed to their antagonism of Japan's drift toward totalitarianism. But at the same time, he had concluded that because business and political leaders he had talked to were disillusioned with the demonstrated impotency of the League of Nations – 
the isolationists would block any direct action to uphold the Nine Power Treaty in China by US. Military force or sanctions. Only a month after becoming Prime Minister, Konoyo was to put this hypothesis to the test when the Sino-Japanese conflict erupted. On the sultry night of July 1, 1937, the incident that sparked an all-out war occurred near Peking's historic Marco Polo Bridge. A jittery unit of the Kwantung Army, which had been sent in to guard Japanese interests in the city, opened fire on a nearby nationalist troop encampment after one of its soldiers suddenly vanished into the dark. It later turned out that he was merely relieving himself, but shots rang out, and in three weeks what had started as another one of hundreds of incidents was escalating into a pitched battle between the rival armies south of the old Manchu capital. China's sovereign rights cannot be sacrificed, even at the expense of war, the nationalist government adamantly proclaimed from Nanking, in rejection of Japan's demands for a fundamental resolution of the incident and recognition of Manchukuo. On August 14, Chiang Kai-shek dispatched his tiny air force to bomb the Japanese base at Shanghai. The fact that they only succeeded in killing innocent Chinese civilians in no way assuaged Japan's anger. It was an outrageous attack on an international port, Tokyo claimed, and vowed a war of chastisement. The war minister hurried to the imperial palace to promise the emperor that he would crush the Chinese in three months. However, the imperial general staff were hesitant to embark on a campaign against China of Napoleonic scale, particularly when they believed that the real threat came from Russia, their old enemy. The Tokyo railroad terminals echoed to the exultant banzais of troops eager to be off to join the triumphant march south of the Kwantung army, which by the autumn had captured Peking and Tientsin, while imperial navy cruisers and a battleship blockaded Shanghai. Public opinion in the United States, which had been largely complacent about the savage civil war raging in Spain, was awakened by newspaper headlines reporting that American missionaries and sailors were being killed in the crossfire in China. National concern that the Asiatic fleet and 2,300 servicemen were helpless to protect Uncle Sam's interests and lives led to a pacifist call for their prompt evacuation, Polls showed this to be the collective wish of nearly half the nation. The president was faced with major political and diplomatic problems as a chorus of international protest was directed at Japan. The United States could not desert China any more than it could intervene, since neither the Americans nor the British could muster more than a token military or naval force. The president wanted to send aid discreetly to Chiang Kai-shek, before the isolationist press learned that ships were being loaded with bombers for China and the Senate furiously demanded the strict application of the Neutrality Act, which prohibited deliveries of arms to belligerents. Roosevelt fumed in private frustration at pacifists, isolationists and bandit nations alike. On October 5, 1937, he made an attempt to rally American and international opinion with a call for action deliberately staged in the isolationists' heartland of Chicago. But his appeal for nations to join together to quarantine Japan before it was too late to check what he called the epidemic of world lawlessness fell on deaf ears. The League of Nations issued its standard condemnations, while Japanese soldiers trampled over the Chinese territory that nine nations had solemnly bound themselves to respect. Tokyo continued to insist that the whole affair was only another incident. Ambassador Gru cautioned Washington on the futility of directing moral thunderbolts to check the aggression of a nation that could now be stopped only by a concerted stand of the part of the Western powers. Britain, which had the most extensive Chinese interests and lacked the strength to defend them alone, looked to the United States to take the lead by summoning to Washington the nine powers who 16 years earlier had vowed to uphold China's sovereignty. In the outburst of isolationist withdrawal that gripped Capitol Hill and the press, Roosevelt refused to give American blessing to sanctions. The conference finally assembled in Brussels in November 1937, but its disunity brought little comfort to the Chinese and further alienated the Japanese. In what proved to be the death rattle of the Washington Treaty System, a fusillade of paper bullets was fired off at Tokyo. The scraps of paper were brushed aside by Japan's military leaders 
who pressed on with a conflict on the mainland that would determine whether they or the Anglo-Saxon powers were to decide the fate of China and the destiny of the Pacific.